Learning Sciences program here in the College of Ed um, under Professor Megan Bang, and I am also um, one of this year's uh, Center for Philosophy for Children and Graduate Fellows. Um, so it's awesome to be here and kind of get to think collaboratively with everybody together. I'm super excited to hear. Our next um, speaker is Ben Lukey, who is the Associate Director at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Manoa's uh, Uhiro Academy for Philosophy and Ethics in Education. Uh, he did his graduate work at the University of Hawaii in philosophy and facilitated philosophy sessions at a variety of Honolulu area uh, elementary schools during that time. Um, he also spent two years facilitating P4C at Loveland Academy, working with children uh, with autism and other developmental disorders. Uh, since 2007, Dr. Luki has served as the philosopher in residence at Kailua High School, working with English and ethnic studies teachers to integrate uh, philosophy for children uh, into Hawaii, or in Hawaii into their curricula. So it's my pleasure to pass it off to Ben. Thank you. Yeah. So, can't get the um, display up. So I just have really a couple of pictures, and we're just going to do this. <laughs> so for those people in the back, you may want to just kind of budge if you want to see the pictures. If not, um, but just to kind of give a little bit of background on myself. Uh, Sorry, I just sat with Jordan with that big long mouthful of our institute, the Uehiro Academy. Uh, at UH, where I work, and we are fortunate enough to be a separate unit within the university that really just supports P4C in schools and the community and universities. So we receive support from uh, an international nonprofit, the university, the College of Arts and Humanities, the College of Education, and local nonprofits, and all of those together that affiliated faculty within the Arts and Humanities, working with the philosophy department. College of Education, working with uh, teacher preparation. But a lot of our work is out in schools, supporting teachers, supporting schools. I spent about three days of my week uh, out at schools working with teachers from K through 12. Um, and really what we're trying, what we've been developing for the past several years, decades I should say, and why is kind of this idea of model schools and now model complexes of having schools that want to be doing kind of philosophy that you can see throughout the school uh, and then throughout multiple schools. So one of the schools I'm going to feature to talk about today is kind of the beginning of our model complex meeting. We have students in that area that are getting kind of P for C, K through, K through 12. Um, so anything that I have that's visual, I'm going to skip over. Another little bit of context, though, is so it seems a lot of people are familiar with P4C, I assume Matthew Littman. So just to quick kind of stamping, so my mentor and I, our director of our academy, Thomas Jackson, went uh, and did the mock fair kind of retreats back in the early 80s and brought P4C back to Hawaii, where we kind of slowly morphed into what we call P4C Hawaii. And really what's emerged, particularly since over the past decade is an emphasis on using P4C Hawaii as an approach to teaching and learning, what we call the philosopher's pedagogy. So as a way, particularly within secondary classrooms, as a way to teach whatever your subject area is, so you know, social studies, English, Japanese, art, uh, whatever it is. So it's really become a kind of broad approach to whatever kind of content you want to uh, discuss. <coughs> Okay, so, and this is, I'll give you a phrase, and I can send this to anybody that's interested. But we say, P4C Hawaii is an approach to teaching and learning that is defined by a conceptual framework, and that really kind of revolves around four ideas, the community, inquiry, philosophy, and reflection, and an accompanying set of activities. And that's what we really are trying to we talk about, kind of creating a, philosoph a philosophical culture at a school, it's really a about kind of expanding that approach. The first school, and this is where it's going to be hard, is I want to talk about. And really, today I'm going to do kind of about half the time or two thirds of the time, it's really going to be some show and tell. Just kind of sharing some of the things that are happening in Hawaii, particularly at high school, 
because I think they're not only in terms of talking about a culture of philosophy, but also in, in a culture of philosophy that's able to kind of tackle some issues of equity, issues of identity, issues of race and ethnicity. Um, and so sharing some of those things and then kind of end by talking a little bit about how do we how do we get to where what it is that I'm showing and talking about, right? Uh, what is what do we do and how do we approach our work? Uh, so the first school I want to talk about is Kaidua High School. And I'm very happy. So and I have the picture here and I'll read it. Uh, this is the kind of Kaidua High School vision and mission. Um, and as Jordan mentioned, I work at Edinburgh High School, I still do, it is a philosopher in residence for many years, since 2007, and we have a former teacher from Edinburgh High School, I'm going to call out Janine in the audience, who was an English teacher at Edinburgh High School, and I worked with for several years, and then, uh, but um, she was there during this kind of, this uh, kind of, burgeoning of philosophy uh, among the school. And really what I wanted to share uh, from this picture is that their vision statement, which was created by a group of teachers and students and administrators that had a series of meetings, Kailua High School's vision statement is, Kailua High School students are mindful, philosophical thinkers prepared to pursue their goals and create positive change in the world. So that thing of the high school viewing themselves as philosophical thinkers, and that was the input from the students. That was part of their self-identity, right? Uh, the administrators were, of course, only too happy. But they had questions, a couple of earlier people mentioned about kind of reservations about this word philosophy. But at this point, when I first started doing this work, I had a lot of that similar kind of resistance. But we've kind of hit the point in Hawaii where I hardly ever have to defend philosophy anymore. Right? I mentioned philosophy in an education setting, and most people, whether it's teachers or students or administrators, go, yes, we want that, uh, which has been several decades in the creating. So, um, again, picture-wise, for those of you that come to Hawaii, so Kailua High School is on the windward side of Hawaii, so it's kind of the east side, right, the side facing the wind. Um, and very sharply distinguished from the town side where Honolulu is, and that's just an important aspect of just the kind of community context, right? Um, and that is the context that we started at Kendall High School, but now we're supporting about seven schools within that complex. Like four elementary schools, two intermediate schools, Um, student demographics, and this is part of, this is background for the ethics of this course I'm going to talk about. So, uh, pie chart, you can see pie chart. <laughs> right. uh, about half the students identify themselves as Native Hawaiian. Right. Uh, this is all self-identification. Um, the next largest in terms of self-identification is white, and then Filipino, Japanese, I mean, there's a, it's a diverse student population, and if they really put it up there as kind of, um, when students register, they can register some multiples, so kind of it's a little bit wonky in terms of numbers, because there's a lot of students of kind of multiple ethnicities. As they come into the high school, they come from two distinct communities. One is Kailua, uh, which is largely middle class middle class, uh, and the other is Waimanalo, which is largely uh, kind of homestead land, lower middle class. So differences in kind of socioeconomic status, differences in ethnicity makeup, uh, differences in a lot of kind of life experiences. And it used to be that when these two populations would come together in the freshman year in high school, it was explosive. Right? Um, there was a history of fights and campus-wide fights and things breaking out in the cafeteria and just a lot of violence particularly happening in, in their freshman year as these two populations of students came together. Um, 
So, beginning in 2005, uh, they started to develop a ethnic studies program. Um, and it's now a required course for graduation at high schools. All students, whether they transfer in or whether they start freshman year, have to take and pass ethnic studies. Um, and it was created with several goals in mind. Um, one was this picture is really helpful because <laughs> uh, it kind of summarizes all the different things that came into the creation of this course. But the first of all is in terms of it being able to address student violence, right, and other kind of student concerns, uh, whether it was substance abuse, whether it was domestic violence, whether it was uh, truancy, um, a whole host of things that the Department of Psychiatry actually at the UH Med School got involved in uh, a project called the Asian Pacific Island Island Prevention Center. We like the big one. Um, so that was one thread, the kind of youth violence prevention aspect. Right? The other thread was P for C and kind of this approach that I talked about to teaching and learning. Um, the other part was ethnic studies curriculum. So doing, the creators do a lot of research on ethnic studies courses that were taught at, they kind of created at Berkeley or at uh, schools, whether it was in Texas and then kind of Maine, but, uh, or at other schools in California, but trying to kind of search what other ethnic studies curricula were out there. And then also social studies, what's happening in terms of histor uh, historical inquiry, and the historical inquiry process. So there was a lot of things that came together in the creation of this course. Um, but I think most important for today, a big part of it concerned sitting in a circle and talking about kind of talking about ourselves. Um, and I'll share I think one activity. It, for early on, uh, they would um, first be a class that would have to go around and they would just write down all the names, we all kind of make name tents, uh, get everyone's name, and then, okay, write down, what do you assume is the ethnicity of everybody in the, and we would kind of leave that term undefined, right? Uh, what do you assume is the ethnicity of everyone, each individual, like the are right now? And then, um, and then they would introduce the actual definition of ethnicity as part of the ethnicity curriculum. And, and then, with that definition in mind, they asked students, how would you describe your own ethnicity? And at this point, then a lot of students would kind of improvise, right? So we had, you know, <coughs> uh, uh, Afro-Japanese, or uh, black you know, whatever it was. Like, they could, they could form whatever they wanted of their ethnicity, and then the others would write down what that person actually identified as their ethnicity. And part of that process then is uh, then they would share, and then they would reflect on how is that as you wrote down your own assumption and hearing what other people actually said, what was that like? And then often people were nervous as they were writing down their assumptions, oh my gosh, am I going to have to share these, because they knew that that was a little bit sensitive. And then Oh, but it actually when somebody said what they, how they identified themselves, that was a lot more interesting. That was a lot more interesting than, than my assumptions. And then, really it formed another way to kind of build the community of the classroom. It continued to get a long-term kind of self-study project, uh, the series of novels. Uh, anybody that's interested in more detail about that course, I'm more than happy to talk about. But, what I want to get to is, some of the kind of outcomes, uh, as this has now been a decade, of, uh, more than a decade of this course has been going on. So, some of the student feedback that we've had is, uh, and I'll just share a couple here. This class has made me understand the importance of others' opinions. Um, ethnic studies has made me think about my self-concept and how my ethnicities make up who I am. Uh, ethnic studies has given me a new perception on race and ethnicity in the world today. So those kind of just uh, student input on 
their thinking of that opera. This is a, unfortunately, reading the wrong quote. But really, the P for C aspect, and I'm going to come back to this a bit later, is the idea of intellectual safety. So this is a student, uh, I apologize for the wrong quote, it's much easier for me to listen to. But intellectual safety is highly stressed. This encourages students to be free thinkers and it allows the students to voice their opinions based upon their various upbringings and cultural background. The class actually gets me to think about the world. This class is cool because we're able to discuss any topic concerning culture or race. It is safe to discuss things that here and voice your opinion. It is a freedom that we don't really have in other classes. I've had hard classes before, but this one takes a lot of thinking. If they, the students, get it, then they will leave with an appreciation for other cultures. That's something you can't take away from someone. Uh, that was a scene in 2007. Right. So in terms of actual like kind of qualitative impact, right, we've definitely noticed it in terms of the students' understanding. In terms of quantitative impact, and again, this is one of the pictures, and really all you need to see is this the, the downward trend in the line, right? Because those bars are the number of school suspensions and incidents at Cuyahoga High School from 2001 to 2007, right? So watching the number of suspensions and incidents, incidents being fights, kind of just steadily decline. So that was good news for the Cuyahoga High School. Um, Here's another graph, again, the line, the number of incidents at Edgewell High School in the first eight weeks of school, 2003 through 2017. Right, so what the school has seen is a dramatic decrease in the number of fights, and even when fights do break out, they tend to be much more kind of one-on-one -on -one affairs rather than groups of people kind of getting in the rooms in the, in the cafeteria or in the kind of commons. So, Far fewer incidents. So in 2017, there were only six incidents, right, uh, in the first eight weeks of school. In 2006, there was 81. Uh, just kind of some numbers. So in terms of that, they've there has been kind of actual evidence that something's happening. Um, it's not going to be necessarily all from ethnic studies, right? I mean, any good researcher knows that. Factors, but it's definitely something that students themselves will cite as to why they're a bit more mellow. They have a bit better understanding of each other because honestly they're doing a lot more listening. Um, I'll go back to that idea a bit later. I am going to skip over Waikiki School. <coughs> Sorry, Waikiki School. Um, it's an awesome school. But I just kind of want to come back to then what we're doing at the New Year Academy. How do we support this type of change in school? Um, and really wanted to share something. Anybody that's interested in reading more about this, I can definitely refer you to, to uh, an article. But we kind of did a self-study as we were trying to think about how do we, how do we understand that these schools, these model schools, where kind of the culture of philosophy seems to be a kind of not self-sustaining culture at the school. So we don't have to go in. Like we know that things would go on even if we weren't visiting the school. And we identify, I think, three parts um, and three aspects. And I think I now I think there's a fourth that's emerging. Uh, the first part is we always try to offer teachers, whether they're new or uh, whether they've been there for how many years, educative experience. So that could be a class, ideally. So right now, for example, uh, I'm teaching a course in the Hawaii, state of Hawaii um, professional development <coughs> system. So teachers get reclassification credits for taking the course. Um, and it's basically our intro P for C course. It's the same one we teach at the university, but it's harder and more expensive for teachers to get credits through the university than it is through the DOE. So teachers in the DOE. Um, so they get introduced, though, to philosophy as this kind of general theory of education. They have their own experience of a community of inquiry. It's modeled for them. A lot of those kind of the framework is explained. A lot of the activities are modeled for them. And we really kind of go through our own kind of in-depth experience. Um, 
And I think first and foremost among those, and this is the thing that I want to come back to, is the emphasis on community and the emphasis on creating an intellectually safe community. And I think one of the things that's, that's somewhat distinctive about P for C, well, why is our emphasis on community? I mean, the others, I'll, I'll hold this up there. I mean, we talk about these four pillars. So it's community, inquiry, philosophy, and reflection. And so there's a lot of other stuff happening in terms of inquiry, in terms of reflection. But I'm not, I'm not going to talk about those parts. Today, I really just kind of want to focus for this symposium on the kind of community and the intellectual safety aspect. Because I really think that's what teachers and students, and from our own observations, that's what they're telling us is making the biggest impact on creating a kind of philosophically rich school culture. And um, it's that aspect of really being able to listen. So intellectual safety is a, is, I'd like to say, it's kind of a regular ideal we set out for students in the beginning, right? Uh, and we have a kind of a sign that's often put up. And it's just uh, all participants in the community, feel free to ask virtually any question or state any view so that it's respect for all of the time. Now, that gives you your first thing, but typically what happens is that that understanding of that, what that means, expands and grows as you go through a semester, a year, several years. They start to recognize that intellectual safety, and I know this within <coughs> philosophy circles is an idea that's being critiqued, but it's often being, I think, miscritiqued as a, as a just a kind of a, a friendliness initiative, right? I mean, we're not talking about a kumbaya circle. Uh, it really is trying to create an intellectually safe place for disagreement, right? for meaningful inquiry, uh, for being able to discuss difficult topics. And what we found from our undergraduates that go into our schools, whether it's Kaiwa High School or Waikiki School or Maria, is that they are able to talk about topics that they say are much more difficult to talk about in their undergraduate classes than they are in these schools because. There's just a general recognition that people are more understanding that your perspective is your perspective and we aren't necessarily trying to win uh, in terms of sharing. Doesn't that mean that I think you're right or that there is no wrong answer, there are no wrong answers, that's a common concern. But that, okay, we can take these differences and, and move forward with those and try to improve and deepen our own um, we often, picture, oh, you see, I didn't bring it, which I'm going to say, because we have my place to vote. I didn't bring a community ball, but the other thing that we use, uh, really for the community is what we call a community ball. I do have a picture on my bed, and I can see it. It's a big yarn ball. You go to our website, it's all right. But using that to not only help facilitate, there's a whole process of helping people recognize that we're part of the shared community. Um, and that community ball and how that's used to um, establish the expectations of the community and the rights of the people in the community is a big part of what we talk about when we talk about the community. So all of that, like the, that's all I was kind of going to talk about, educated experience, I don't know, I'm not going to tell you. But the other aspects then of this model I was talking about is once somebody goes to the class and they understand a bit more about what it means, what does it mean when we talk about intellectual safety? What does it mean when we talk about playing the life? We talk about inquiry itself. Uh, why do we do reflection? How can we do reflection? Is that they then get some kind of in-class support uh, once they go back to their classroom. And that could come from somebody like me, somebody coming from the university. It could come from somebody that the school has kind of designated as a kind of coach. It could come, honestly, we have a, in that the reason we've been able to grow in that windward side of Hawaii is that we're now using high school students as facilitators. We have a group of, this past this semester right now, about 13, we call them field surfers, um, because the high school is the surf riders, so they have field surfers. And they go out and they facilitate inquiry uh, 
uh, help teachers in, in those seven schools that I mentioned, right? So they worked with about 30 different teachers, more than like 1,200 different students, uh, and that's they get a they get a well, like a, it's an internship, it's like a career, it's like a career track, right? Where they get released and they got all coordinated, so they drive out for their time period and they go and work with kindergarten students, and we run a boot camp for them like the first six weeks of their high school semester, like, because they're really good at facilitating with secondary, but like, you gotta like, do some stuff on what do you do with kindergartens, what do you do with first grade, you know, like, that type of stuff, but they've been able to provide a lot of that kind of in-class support, uh, which is a big part of our kind of second kind of coach problem. Skip over that. We then try to take, whoever those people are, we then try to, the third thing is to create a kind of a, a, um, a professional community to integrate the school. And that could be two people, two teachers, it could be a whole faculty, but trying to kind of help facilitate regular meetings among that group where they can then talk and continue to share about what's happening in their classroom. Oh, I did this the other day, and this worked really well, or this bad, where are we? Like, why are we doing this? Right? It's like questions about, you know, leading and writing and why certain are important or philosophical questions that come up that we realize we don't get the chance to talk about, right? Those professional meeting times uh, end up being really productive. Janine was able to be a part of several of those, so ask her. Uh, so I'll close just a couple things. This is, by the way, our first group. <laughs> right? And they came from, and there's that kind of that word, this classroom spot. Um, the student facilitators, I think, is this is our next wave. Really, this is why I asked uh, Janice about kind of students as well, because I think what we're recognizing, in, in addition to be, being able to offer teachers kind of educated experience, being able to kind of provide in class support, helping form professional communities in is the more that we can tap in to students, we're finding it really, really improves our, our ability to kind of improve outcomes and increase our impact in schools. Uh, so whether that's within an elementary school, having sixth graders go down and help out the kindergartners, or that's across schools, uh, that's kind of a new direction to really kind of help. How does culture spread? Culture spreads through kind of osmosis and that's that's the new agent for us that's emerging. This is another student. So I think with that I'm gonna make sure I don't have any more of the parents right now. But uh, <laughs> uh, I will
kind of a thought, a little bit more of a thoughtful question, right? Something that invites them to share their thinking if they're ready to do so. Um, so if I'm working with a group of teachers, I might ask them, you know, uh, what do you think makes somebody a good teacher, right? So it's open, and it can be very quick, or they could be expansive if they want. But it, from that initial go around, from those three types of questions, you get a lot of information about your participants, which then as a teacher or facilitator, you can then work with knowing who you might need to invite, who you might need to kind of like, okay, this person isn't quite listening to others, kind of just likes to talk, so you need to be aware of how to communicate. And then, after it's all done, you add as much yarn as you want, do the magic process, and then turns into this fluffy <laughs> yarn community ball. And I'll go back, and then I usually introduce the kind of the rules of the community ball. And we say, right, the person holding the ball has the right to speak. Right, that's the person who gets the ball. Um, when you're holding the ball, though, you get to choose. You have the right to, to invite somebody else. Right. So rather than the teacher deciding who goes next, the participants themselves uh, get to to go next. And that comes with its own community challenges, right? Because what if, you know, Johnny and Susie just keep passing it back to each other? The boys never pass it to the girls. The girls never pass it to the boys. Oh my God. But then, you also have the right to pass. So if you get the ball, and you don't have anything to say, you're not comfortable yet, you need more time to pass. Um, but, what it does is that it gives students a structure and it immediately then reveals the different things that are going to come up in terms of almost always if you have a student that really likes to talk and they'll always ask for the ball. And often students are used to giving that person the ball, say the hand raised, and so and then we realize, okay, that's kind of holding his back. This person's talking, or she's doing all the talking. Um, and so we kind of slowly recognize, okay, we get more people involved, and we start to shift. We recognize, oh, people we never hear from. Them. So, like, you know, teachers will say, like, Rika's doing all this writing in her journal, but we never get to hear from her in class, so let's invite her, right? And eventually, usually, the student will pick up on the invitation. But that ball just becomes, and students become possessive about it. That's their ball. It's, it is the symbol of their community. Uh, so people start pulling out into the yarn, they get the fit. Young kids, though, they get possessive about the screens. Anyway, it, is, it does end up being a, a really helpful tool for a facilitator being able to, from the beginning, understand and get an initial read on the community, but then helping the students kind of take ownership of that community as things progress. Just like with all of yeah. to what extent then? Yeah. A lot of times they will eventually sort it out. So we say, and we when we talk about community, we usually talk about like beginning, emerging, and kind of mature communities, right? So community is a short hand post. But I'm only talking about community. Um, so in a beginning community, we say you often you have to be a bit more pedagogically strong, right? Just to, you can't just give students the freedom to to speak and to invite and assume that they're gonna just take off and be highly successful with it, right? Because they will get frustrated. So typically, you have to come in and say, nope, let's get more people involved. Or we have other people that are waiting, right? If someone's talking and talking and talking, the facilitator does need to kind of cut in. And usually then the other people see, ah, I see, because that's reinforcing, no, no, we're trying to get more people. We're not, we're trying to not, you know, kind of exclude, we want to get more people. And eventually, as usually a couple happens where a student will take the first step and they'll invite And then it kind of is a trickle and it'll build and eventually as it continues you can step back. But early on I think often, and some teachers will make another little mini community wall for themselves that kind of gives them. But often they're already used to the teacher just doing whatever they want anyway. So they don't typically, you know, kind of complain if the teacher says, wait, or kind of just interrupts. 
once you get to a mature community, if the teacher interrupts, then they complain. Now they recognize, no, 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 you have to have a bar. <laughs> um, but yeah, early on. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, the, Good the graphs you showed us, especially if it's tailing off in terms of any incident or violence in, in the first six weeks, then you would wonder how that. So, no, it's, it's offered happen. all four. Well, so it went from a quarter course which is, to now it's a semester course because it's now officially called Ethnic Studies and Philosophy. So, they added another kind of unit on to it. Uh, just because they realized they have so much they couldn't fit in. Um, but it's, you can take that uh, the first or the second semester. So I think part of that impact is not, you're not seeing just of when they're taking it, but you're seeing what's happened is the impact on student culture. It's largely with the sophomores, juniors, and seniors who then I think are happy, are much more effective at kind of undercutting some of the kind of tension that may be there among the freshmen. So, because remember all these students were in school together, middle school. So it's coming up and rather if you come up and you know, you're having some conflict or tension with somebody from Kailu or whatever it is, right? Then the upperclassmen are usually there to say, they're having more kind of conflict. So I don't, I don't think it's that timing necessarily as much as it is a larger kind of build, a cumulative effect on how the school culture is Then I guess just as a follow-up, I do really want to know. So, so what do you, what are the topics or what are the texts and things you okay. use in the studies? One, one, and this is coming back to Amy's point. One book that they use, which I highly recommend, not necessarily for Seattle, mm -hmm. but from Hawaii, it's fantastic. It is called the Tattoo. Uh, and it's, a, it's about um, a young man growing up in Kailua, going through elementary school, high school, into an adulthood, and the kind of issues that he faces. And it's, it's not, it's written by a local author. Uh, it's, it's quite good. And it's large sections of it are written in pidgin. We often hear from the students that it's the only book that they read. Often because we read it together in class. You have to read it together in class, uh, and then they kind of discover it. Uh, but that was a key text. They do a lot of kind of self-reflection. They do their self-concept paper that they do. And my colleague uh, Amber Makaya, that's what she did her dissertation on the self-concept problem. Um, is uh, they have, they kind of question themselves, but then they have to interview others in their life. So there's kind of an ongoing kind of interviewing friends, grandparents, and then they do a, a study of all of this interview. They code it, right? So they code it for like, what are the themes that came out of all these interviews? And so their self-concept is kind of comprised of all of these other aspects, you know, input from other people. Uh, they, do units on kind of ideal democracies. There's a set of vocabulary that they learn that comes from, I like, think, the ethnic studies curriculum they got from. Honestly, but that makes sense. Exactly. They just need a mental connection right now. Um, but there is kind of a vocabulary. They do projects with that vocabulary to just understand the terms that we're talking about. Um, and to come back to kind of Luce's question earlier, right? Like introducing the term like, ideal democracy, which is, you know, like first introducing the term race, what do you mean by race? Introducing the term, you know, just so that they they recognize that this is an actual, there is a, this has an official meaning. <laughs> um, and they can do with it what they want. But um, the vocabulary, book, self concept essay, I think those are the main threads right now. And each of those units usually last about three to six weeks. Yeah, I guess I just I was struck by race as a thing for the 
it's so, it's exactly a thing. No, no, not an official it is. And that, but it is, is that it's a construct, right? That, that, and then, you know, there's a quote I didn't read that, you know, there was actually a student said, it's like, oh, I, you know, I learned that place is not something that's real. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's what I mean in terms of these terms. Yeah, I, that was the wrong thing. But I think Um, okay, so I'm thinking of somebody like Linda Smith, or like the government in the government. She's quite theoretical and quite philosophical, but she also documents how uh, the Maori, in fact, sometimes look at Kiwi for research right, as part of the global European uh, relationship with the Maori. And so she's looking at more or less indigenous Maori methodologies, let's say philosophies and theories. So I'm wondering, because you're in a Hawaiian context, which may be somewhat comparable to the Maori context, um, what your experience is with, because these are older students than five, six, or seven years old, right? So they're getting into almost college age where philosophy is a major, for example. Yeah. And so, on one hand, yes, there's philosophizing and philosophical talk and thinking, but there's also sort of philosophy, let's say, the meaning of knowledge, traditions, sometimes even can exist. So, it, what do you sense is their entrance into this thing called philosophy, and is, do they push for indigenous Hawaiian philosophies? Yours is ethnic studies and philosophy, so it's like it's right under the surface of the So I think in terms of our approach like to philosophy, it really is not the discipline or the canon. It really is much more the activity. Um, and so that tension, I think, they don't quite pick up on. So almost automatically, all of their theorizing locally or individually grounded in their experience. And every once in a while you get somebody who's done some kind of other reading, but then it's immediately, because everyone's talking together, it's immediately intersected with everybody else's kind of, wait, whoa, wait, wait, no, no, wait about this, what about this kind of input. Um, I think from what's interesting about that, then, is they go, because a lot of these students have gone on to college, obviously, and so when they take philosophy courses University, typically what, a couple things happen. Some students get really discouraged because what they find in their university courses is there's not a lot of philosophizing. So they get, they don't like it because they, they're used to thinking and now they just have to kind of memorize. So that's just certain things, right? Others get good courses they like it. as long as they, they're used to what I think about this. How do I, as long as they're, they view themselves as thinking, and then, when they're introduced to the canon, I think in some sense, they, I, what they've reported to me at least, is they tend not to think in terms of those categories. So immediately to them, they, when they, if they read Kant, or they read Aristotle, or whatever it is, it isn't, it isn't trying to understand that, it's like, wait, wait, how do I make sense of this? Like, they're immediately trying to apply it to their own life. And therefore, I think a lot of that kind of competing, that stuff doesn't come in as much. It's much more prevalent among our UH students that are coming in, particularly University of UH, the UH philosophy program. Is, that's a comparative program. So we're already always kind of pushing boundaries anyway. So for those, our students, when they, we take them in, they're making all sorts of connections. Oh, here's that. So there's a woman at uh, UH Hilo, it's on another island, that did a, her dissertation on kind of Hawaiian epistemology. And so she's been really drawn into the BBC. But for a lot of that, like, so she's seeing all this stuff happening in the classroom. But the students themselves, yeah, they don't, it's not, it's not, they're not engaging with that domain and that kind of that discourse. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. so. I know where time is. I'm 
uh, curious about just kind of the um, the year that that ethnic studies course was offered and rolled out um, versus that sharp decline. Whether you noticed, you know, was there a significant impact in the first year or two that it was offered, or did it? Oh, yeah, so it started in 2000, just to, just to go back to the, the chart, it started in 2005 when it was piloted. It did become a, uh, a really kind of a full-on kind of part of the course until like 2007, but we really didn't start to see declines until more towards like 2010, 2011. So it did, it took, it took a while, right, and kind of coming back to to your point, it wasn't like immediately. We did have, because again, some people recognize that so much of student fighting is socially triggered, right? Um, it's not, you might understand, I don't really need to fight this person, but if you have a group of people urging you to fight that person, that's much harder to resist. Um, even if you don't want to fight that person. And that's what we would have students talk about. It's like, I didn't want to fight, this was a non-issue, but I had to fight because either parental, I mean, yeah, honestly, it's getting parents. Anyway, that's another issue. But yeah, it took it took it took time. It took a lot of time uh, before those other factors. I think. Okay, thank you so much.